rockets, which are actually called the SRBs, uh, these actually limit uh, the distance the space shuttle can travel. Um, so uh, must be wondering, like, why don't they make bigger SRBs so the space shuttle could go for further out? Uh, uh, it happens so that uh, these SRBs are manufactured in the state of Utah in the United States, uh, a place called Theocol. And the reason why the limitation of the size of these SRBs or these boosters is because a hole in a mountain which was put in place hundreds of years ago. And the hole in the mountain is just wide enough for this train to actually get through, hence the size of the SRB is determined by the hole in the mountain. And you must be wondering like, okay, why is it that hole in the mountain is that small? Well, it's determined by the size of these tracks. These railway tracks um, were introduced, at least in the United States, uh, by the British. And I, I know that uh, people in India know a little bit about the British community. Uh, they were over here for quite some time. And there was a standard that was introduced by them, which is that the width of these tracks is four feet, eight and a half inches. Remember that number, four feet, eight and a half inches. Well, it happens, like I said, like the British came to the US, they introduced the railway system in the United States, as well as uh, most part of South East Asia. Well, the standard that they came in and the trains that they built could only go on these trams, which used to come into London uh, and other parts of uh, the United Kingdom to bring in coal so that they could actually power. These trams used to run on tracks which were four feet, eight and a half inches wide. What happens if you go further back into history that the guys who uh, created these wagons and put the railway tracks in most part of uh, the United Kingdom used to use these wagons and these wagons ran on tracks which were four feet, eight and a half inches wide. One wonders, like, why, why four feet, eight and a half inches wide? Well, you've got to go further back in time uh, and look at the roads. And the struts in these roads were burnt in for the wagons that you actually used to go out on the roads. And these roads and the width of that was four feet, eight and a half inches. So if you actually wanted to take your wagon through these roads and not have it tip over, you wanted to make sure the width of your wagon wheels was four feet, eight and a half inches wide. Well, we got to go a little bit further back and say like, who built these roads? Any guesses in Europe, early parts of imperial time? Give some hints. You're right. The Romans. The Romans had chariots and these chariots were four feet, eight and a half inches wide. And you wonder why were the Romans who were so meticulous about building things uh, and, and building uh, 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 all the great empire that they uh, put in place, why did they choose this unique number of four feet, eight and a half inches wide? Well, it happened so that uh, they did an average study. They looked at a lot of the horses and the distance between two horses ass came out to be four feet, eight and a half inches wide. So it goes back into thousands of years that the Romans decided that the width of the wagons that they, or the chariots that they'll be running on depends on the average size of two horses' ass, which is four feet, eight and a half inches, which then determined how wide the tracks the wagons will run on, which then determined how wide the tracks the trams would run on, which determined the railway system, and thereupon you know the whole story I covered. So back thousands of years ago, we decided how far the space shuttle is actually going to go. So these two towers determine the distance these two towers can go. So think about legacy code. Thousands of years ago, we decided like the space shuttle is going to go only based on two horses' asses width. Second analogy, and which is uh, around to the internet. And I, I struggled uh, uh, while I was actually putting this analogy in place that what really defines the internet? Um, how can I actually go back 
and take a look at something which will help define how innovation has actually transpired. And the closest thing that I could think of um, was electricity. Uh, this is the actual patent that uh, Thomas Edison filed in 1880. Uh, and the light bulb, which sits in a museum, which was he built a light bulb which was used and run on electricity. And for a very long time, the only app that was used over a period of time uh, using electricity was just the light bulb. This is a power generator uh, back in the early 1900s in uh, uh, lower uh, Manhattan in New York, uh, which was put in place so that about 1,000 homes in New York could be lit up uh, with electricity uh, and people could replace the candlelights that they had in the houses with light bulbs. And for the next 30 years, the killer app using electricity was a light bulb. And, and, and you wonder, like, when did really the innovation around electricity started happening? So you got to look at in the 1900s, the first electric fan came out, I mean, helping people cool off. Uh, but uh, there were some limitations around how to use an electric fan. Uh, the vacuum cleaner, I mean, I kid you not, this is the first vacuum cleaner built out in the United Kingdom. Uh, which weighed around 300 pounds and probably required five people to move around in your house. Imagine th today, if you had to move around this uh, vacuum cleaner, I, I, I'm sure the wives and the housemaids in the house wouldn't be too happy uh, having this kind of model versus the Dysons that we have uh, and the Hoovers that we have now. And then something revolutionary happened, which was the electric toaster was invented. And uh, prior to that, uh, the way you actually toasted your bread was put it on fire. And uh, believe me, there were plenty of burnt toasts that people had for breakfast. So, uh, and, and you wonder, why do I have the circle around uh, the socket over here? Well, it turned out um, uh, the way to use this electric toaster was to put it up in the light bulb. I mean, the concept of actually using appliances was, hey, there's a the reason why electricity used to be in your house was to light a light bulb. So when the iron came out, you had to take out your light bulb, put in your electric iron, and do the ironing. Uh, but the, and, and this is uh, just to show you an example of uh, a place in Disney World, which actually uh, shows how different appliances, all connected up in the um, uh, light sockets, uh, running different things in the house. And then something changed, uh, which I think was the second killer app uh, that came out uh, to utilize electricity. And that was the washing machine. It really revolutionized uh, uh, the way uh, clothes were washed. I mean, instead of scrub rubbing and scrubbing at home, now you had something electric that you could use. But you can imagine the combination of a washing machine with water and electricity up in a light bulb. I mean. Uh, this thing was so huge that you actually had to keep it out in your porch. Um, and, and really, uh, in order for you to switch it off, there was no on and on switch. You had to yank off the wire, and you couldn't yank out the, uh, the wire because it was screwed up into the light bulb. So in order for you to uh, avoid a disaster of getting your clothes stuck or hair, in my case, probably that wouldn't have worked, uh, you would have to run into the house, unscrew it out uh, to make sure that you didn't have an accident happen. And uh, after... A lot of accidents, uh, the next generation architecture came out, which was an electrical socket. And that really uh, revolutionized how applications came on board. I mean, once the socket was built out, um, uh, obviously the on and off switch was also uh, conceived, and that, that really kick-started all uh, things that we see today. And, uh, if I were to just really put the analogy in place, you can see that today, um, without even thinking, I mean, we're all sitting over here. Uh, this guy is actually videotaping using some electric power. I have a laptop over here. We don't think about it. We think it's a necessity. It has to be over here. And it's in the back of our mind. Because what really uh, these applications did and that socket did was reduce the friction that we had with electricity and the applications. and and. If I were to chart the numbers over here, I mean, it's mind-boggling the growth that we are seeing. 
But if I were to chart the growth of the internet right now, I would put it somewhere between the washing machine and the TV. We're still in early ages of the internet, and there's a lot to uh, look forward for in the future. And I'm having a virus scan run my computer over here. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. And hence, uh, I come into the argument, which was also the topic of my uh, session, which is wallet in the cloud. What is wallet in the cloud? Yes, it's a pretty uh, phone or a device in the cloud uh, with a money sign in, in between, but it really is about how m-commerce and how mobile has really revolutionized uh, our online uh, uh, time that we spend and how we are actually doing transactions. And, and the company that you can give a little bit of credit to, um, I mean, Apple really changed and paved the way how we started looking at applications that came on board. Uh, it was them uh, who brought out a smartphone which opened up the doors for a lot of the developers over here uh, who've been able to build successful applications on the iPhone and now Google competing with the Android and the Blackberry doing on their store. Hence, a lot of opportunities created by Apple. Uh, and when we talk about uh, smartphones and legacy phones, the Symbian phones to a smartphone, uh, the growth is phenomenal. Uh, just alone in India, uh, you have about 8 million subscribers uh, join every month through different providers. That's Airtel, Vodafone, Aircel, uh, Docomo, all of the uh, mobile providers uh, in India, it's about 8 million subscribers coming on board. And about 15% of them have smartphones. So the penetration right now of the subscribers coming on board is increasing day by day with a lot of those people uh, utilizing smartphones. And there's a uh, study done by uh, Cisco uh, which talks about by the year 2014, uh, there will be 90% of the population in the world will have cell phones. And the cell phone penetration uh, of internet usage is going to be far exceeding the electricity that comes to your house right now. So imagine 3 billion subscribers using mobile phones uh, in the world versus the electricity penetration that we have, which I doubt it is 90% in the world right now. So, I, I, I hear those statistics and I go, wow. And then we start looking into uh, the social networks which have come on board. Uh, Facebook, ever since it opened up its platform, uh, has really allowed developers to bring their applications online. Uh, today, Facebook, out of their 400 million users which are on Facebook, 100 million of those actually access the Facebook site through their mobile devices. So while I'm out over here, if I would ever get this coverage from Vodafone in this building, I would be Facebooking and putting up my pictures of all the sessions that I've been doing. I hardly go to the website. Uh, you look at uh, applications such as iFart, uh, and, and, I, and I laugh. I don't know how many, how many of you guys have heard of the application iFart? I'll give you two, two seconds about it. Uh, simply put it, it's an application that a developer built on the iPhone to play dirty kinds of farts that you have. He put, uh, sold this application and in two days, he made $40,000. I mean, granted that after a while that uh, Apple didn't want to um, have this high up on their ratings because they didn't want people to think that the applications that developers are building out on their platform have something to do with the farts, but, but at least it just showed uh, the, the growth and the potential of actually building applications on the, on the mobile devices. Um, and the lines between offline and online are really uh, blurring. I mean, the fact that we have more and more users using mobile devices, just alone in India, uh, there's a lot of commerce that is done where people do top-ups and people pay their utility bills. Similarly, in the U.S., uh, on the iPhone, there's an application called uh, Red Laser, uh, which allows you to barcode scan items uh, on your iPhone and get um, uh, the price for it. Uh, well, there's a developer and a company called Shop Savvy, which has utilized PayPal's APIs 
and takes it a step further. Uh, they not only allow you to uh, uh, scan the product in a store, but within the inline experience allows you to purchase that with comparison from all different stores. So imagine if you were at a local store over here at the mall trying to buy, um, let's say, uh, a Nintendo Wii, and you know there are four or five other stores out in the city. Well, if they can get, capture that data, uh, allow you to barcode, scan it, rather than pick up the phone and call your friends and, hey, can you go check those stores out? You get that data on your phone right away and lets you know what's the best possible price available, either in a retail store or online, and allows you to buy the uh, product that you're looking for right from there. Uh, and then we start looking at mobile transactions. Um, uh, and I'll just build, let this slide build out a little bit. Uh, it's really taken five years at PayPal when we started looking at uh, uh, mobile transactions uh, to really see a significant uh, bump in the, the volume of transactions that we started seeing. And, and our prediction is that this is going to grow uh, much stronger in 2010, 11, and 12. Uh, but just look at the numbers. Like in 2005, we really had absolutely no revenue coming in. In 2009, we saw $140 million come through mobile transactions just using the PayPal application. So where does this take us? Uh, we talk about uh, different uh, businesses and different needs that we've had. Uh, when the internet came upon uh, a while back, it was very hard for us to imagine a day when we would stop writing letters. Uh, the way I used to communicate with my family uh, back in college initially was writing uh, letters, and very quickly I came across email. I was like, oh, this is much easier than writing a letter. Granted, now when I sit down with my kids and try to write something, my handwriting looks worse than my two-year-old because I haven't written anything in so long because we're so used to typing and doing everything electronically. Similarly, imagine uh, a time where you can actually pay for your gas at a gas station through your mobile phone, uh, pay for your laundry through your mobile phone, buy groceries through mobile phone. All of these things are actually already happening. Even in India today, uh, a lot of you guys do top-ups through your mobile phone. You don't actually walk into a store uh, already doing mobile transactions. When you want to buy some IPL tickets or you want to buy tickets for the railway, well, those are available right now through your mobile phone. Uh, and it allows you to do commerce uh, through a mobile device. Hence, you have trusted some entity uh, to store your credentials and your wallet and make it easy for you to do a transaction. And why I'd actually noticed this. So in their I believe uh, February issue, uh, they said, well, wallet in the cloud is the way uh, the future is going. And uh, uh, they did a cover story on it. And if you actually happen to get the magazine of this or just check their story on the internet, it's quite interesting. And then we start looking at uh, some of the uh, marquee brands testing out applications. Um, in the US, uh, though I don't own a Mercedes, my boss does, uh, he has an application uh, which is provided by the Mercedes on the iPhone, which allows him to locate his car in a lot and unlock it through his iPhone. Uh, that is something that people are testing out. Redbox, uh, something which has really killed the business for Blockbuster, if you guys are aware that used to be uh, a movie ranking place, allows me now on my iPhone to rent a movie, find a location, buy it, so that by the time I actually go to a kiosk in a grocery store, their model is, they have kiosks. Within those kiosks, you can actually go rent the movie, and it's a dollar to rent the movie. And the, the longer you keep, uh, extra dollar you pay for the day. So it just makes my life easier than to go stand in a line. I, I can reserve the movie on my phone. By the time I go to the grocery store, that movie is only held for me. I don't have to actually wait in a line. I pick it up and I walk out. Bump. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have uh, recently heard the news. Uh, PayPal in, uh, released their updated application on uh, the iPhone which now allows me to bump money. Uh, bump is an application where you just hit two hands and allows me to send money to uh, a sender. So you can still do it in the traditional way of actually going online and entering someone's email address or phone number to pay someone. But imagine just bumping someone money as you're standing. Uh, that's, that's change. That's innovation. Uh, and companies such as Starbucks and uh, Chipotle, a, a Mexican uh, place in the US, allows you to order your stuff through your mobile device, through their iPhone application, 
and just pick it up through a drive through uh, These are changes. This is, this is real stuff that is happening, and, and to some extent also going beyond the uh, U.S. and European borders. If we look at uh, the untapped opportunity, uh, it's about $280 billion uh, of e-commerce that happens in the United States. And only 4% of that, if you look at it, happens online. Uh, just alone in India, uh, the commerce is about 2,000 crore. Uh, that's not a small number. And only 1% of that actually happens online. So the opportunity over there is quite huge. So you have a huge potential uh, of actually bringing businesses which are on offline uh, without having them going on the web straight into uh, mobile applications or mobile solutions. Um, and, and I'll conclude because I wanted to leave uh, some questions over here at the end uh, to answer with a study uh, that was recently done uh, by Nortel. Uh, they talk about uh, the three things that someone really cares about. It's their wallet, it's their phone, and it's their keys. And the thing that they f the people forget the most uh, when they leave their house is actually their wallet. So that's a study done by Nortel recently to indicate that you will walk out of the house with your phone and probably forget your keys and your wallet. Uh, with that, what PayPal says is that we'll take care of the wallet We'll put the wallet in the cloud and help you transact with that, and we'll let someone else worry about the keys. Uh, that I'll, I'll leave you guys with a small uh, video, uh, which just gives you an idea of the potential of what you can. Some things will never change. We will continue to buy bread and crush it with milk. Love will still be the greatest feeling in the world when it's not the worst feeling in the world. A drink will still be a nice ending to a rough day and the perfect beginning to a great night. Families will still have their favorite meals. And moms will still make them best. Some things will never change. Thanks to you. So I don't know how many of you guys know about x.com. That's what I'm uh, here to talk about. Uh, we've got some great APIs. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are a couple of sessions that are happening later uh, during the week which will, will show you how you can actually incorporate these uh, APIs into either web solutions or mobile solutions. Uh, our developer conference, which where we actually launched our APIs last year, November 3rd, uh, has generated a lot of interest. Our next conference, I just announced this last week, is on October 26th, 27th in San Francisco. So if you, can, uh, if you happen to be in the U.S. or want to come over there, there are multiple ways of getting involved with us. So get engaged with our community, and uh, I'll probably be raffling out uh, about 10 tickets. Uh, last year as well, I flew 10 developers across the globe to be present at our conference. And unfortunately, I didn't have anyone from India. So there, this, this year, there is an opportunity for you guys to be part of our community uh, and uh, be involved. So a lot of our documentation, a lot of us as tools and SDKs can be found on x.com. Uh, we do have a booth over here. We've got two sessions uh, uh, being held. One is tomorrow, which is uh, payments for the web and future. Uh, and another workshop, uh, which is more like a code and build, where we will sit down with you, we'll show you exactly how to integrate these APIs, how you can actually uh, utilize our iPhone library, which we've announced, which allows you to build an application, um, embed payments into it, as long as it's a physical good that you're selling. So iPhone restricts you to sell digital good applications using PayPal as a solution, but it does not restrict you to sell physical goods. So imagine that if you wanted to sell bats, cricket bats, you can actually sell them using an iPhone application versus if you were selling uh, theme songs, that would not be allowed uh, through the iPhone. So uh, do attend Khurum session uh, on Friday to learn about it. And uh, did I mention that we're giving netbooks out 
at our booth. I think we're the only uh, uh, people over here giving out some giveaways. Uh, it's not easy. You've got to come out and uh, solve a small uh, uh, problem, uh, which is uh, decrypting some code and giving some answers. But you all are developers over here, so I couldn't have actually put a problem and not expected good solutions out of it. Uh, stop by our booths to get uh, some more details. Uh, and now I'll open up the floor for any questions. I'm sorry I went a bit quick, uh, but I just wanted to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions. And hopefully I didn't bore you guys with the uh, presentation which talked about uh, frameworks and uh, 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 databases and really showing you code in the middle of the afternoon. Wow, a silent crowd. All the payments, for example, what we now use, in, I use my phone is a HDFC small application. For, that is the smallest application I use on my mobile phone. So how can, uh, uh, what is the background which goes on, like how is it secure? So um, it took us about three years to open up this platform. Um, uh, and one of the main reasons why we spent a lot of time thinking about it, it was how can we make the transactions safe and secure uh, for the end users and for the developers who actually integrate with it. So we have very complex uh, compliance and security models in place. If you're familiar with the PayPal brand, uh, it does bring uh, a peace of mind when you actually integrate with it unlike uh, just a regular provider or someone who's actually building a payment gateway uh, who you can't trust. Uh, you don't know if they would actually have that uh, due diligence. Will they have a team in place? Will they have the right risk models in place? Are they actually vetting the application correctly? Uh, that's the piece that we actually bring to the table. Uh, as far as the iPhone library is concerned, attend our session on Friday, and Khurram will be able to give you a little bit more details or stop by at our booth. So, so just like today, uh, as an end consumer, if you want to send money to someone, uh, it's a re direct relationship between uh, a consumer to consumer. So I'll, I'll take a step back and explain you a little bit about uh, PayPal. PayPal started about uh, seven years, years ago, uh, uh, again, uh, through uh, uh, a concept of being able to send money from a Palm device to another Palm device. So the founders who actually came up with the model of PayPal, it was about sending money from a Palm device to another Palm device. Little in their minds did they ex actually expect that uh, PayPal would be a way that people would start preferring to pay online. So a lot of people, consumers, like uh, two friends who are living together, wanted to pay each other rent. Uh, that's how they started using uh, PayPal. So PayPal was just acting as a gateway in between. Uh, then five, three, five years ago, I believe, uh, we decided that uh, after this became the preferred way on eBay, on how people were actually paying or completing transactions because they started trusting the model, we decided to take PayPal off eBay and introduce the merchant uh, opportunities. Uh, that you can see a lot of the merchants who come online today uh, don't have the penetration of uh, being able to get uh, uh, traffic onto their site. And as soon as they actually integrate PayPal, it can actually be generated through the marketing engine. So for a consumer, me as a consumer or you as a consumer who wants to buy uh, maybe Royal Challenger's uh, shirt that uh, uh, the captain wears over here or the Dravid wears, and uh, you want to purchase it on an internet site, it enables PayPal integration. So the consumer actually finds a benefit by going to a merchant site. Merchant finds it easier to get traffic onto their site. The relationship at that point is between the merchant and PayPal on how they actually uh, finish the transaction. But for a consumer's point of view, they get a benefit of being able to purchase something uh, online. Uh, and then the third wave, which is opening up our platform, uh, where we see uh, you as developers should not have to worry about how payments are settled and how uh, payments are made. Uh, by utilizing PayPal's uh, platform and our APIs, uh, you certainly have the ability of uh, creating a business which is not just domestic focused, but you can actually also go cross-border. 190 countries, 24 currencies supported. So suddenly you're building an application sitting in India where you can have your customers be based in Singapore, in the US or United Kingdom, being able to do e-commerce with you. 
So overall, the relationship that you establish is either a one-to-one -one relationship, either a merchant-to-consumer relationship, or you're enabling people to be able to build applications. So those are the uh, different case scenarios that we can cover. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, through a product uh, on the phone right now, Shop Savvy, uh, it allows you to uh, look at a particular product or you look at multiple products and see the comparison prices that are available. That's available online right now through Shop Savvy. It's very easy for, for one of you guys to build a comparison shopping website, uh, which enables uh, someone who comes to the site to look at, look, uh, should I buy the Wii, should I buy uh, Sony PlayStation, or should I go for the Xbox? That's a comparison of three products. You could also do a comparison of different prices available from different vendors on your site. And that's pretty much available right now. So right now it's supported in multiple languages. Uh, if you are a Java developer, you have uh, the toolkits available from our site. A PHP developer, those are available. We're also looking at opening these up in uh, Python uh, in uh, JSP, uh, but uh, those are iterations that we are looking in, into. .NET developers, there are a few APIs available right now, not all of them, but again, we, we, we gotta hear the feedback. Uh, can I get a show of hands on how many Java developers or .NET developers? Obviously, today being the .NET day, I'm sure there's a lot of .NET developers. Uh, and what is your preferred language uh, to do coding in? C Sharp. Okay, Hurum, make a note of that. Website development, uh, let's say it's my personal page, I want to have a PayPal integration to sell my goods online. So for CMS like Drupal or Joomla, so do PayPal uh, develop uh, the um, uh, bridge components or is I have to go for the CMS and ask for a, a, a component for the integration? Uh, I run a foundation, a private foundation, uh, and I collect uh, donations online, and that's actually built on PHP. It took me five lines of code to integrate our donation, donate button, uh, and it was working easily. So if that's what you want to do is just a quick checkout model, uh, it enables you to actually just uh, integrate directly into it by putting a few lines of code. Now that's the regular model of you being able to pass someone off from your side over to a PayPal side and come back. Through our adaptive suite of APIs, uh, what Kurum will talk uh, on Friday is the ability of having an inline experience. So you don't actually leave your site to go complete a transaction, you can actually build it right into your UI flow. Uh, that will go a little bit more detail on Friday about. So it's the adaptive suite. Yes, they are. So everything, so I should be very clear. When you come and use PayPal, there is no money involved that you give to us. There's only money involved that flows from our gateway into your accounts. So you as developers, once you integrate with PayPal, you'll not be left wondering if I'm, I'm actually gonna be able to monetize f for my application or not. You're not left wondering, hey, let me put it some sort of an AdSense model or let me put advertising into my application. And that's the only way that I'll be able to make money. You will see real money flow into your account. So absolutely all the documentation, all the APIs, all the sample code, it's all free. The only thing that we ask is, and we've made our documentation uh, uh, available outside authentication, but it's always good to get involved in the community uh, it's always good to see what other people are building out. So register on x.com uh, and uh, get a community name. That enables you to get a little bit more stuff, such as research. Like, you might be building a mobile application, but the research that I might make available through O'Reilly or through GigaOM, I might put it behind authentication. So it's just like one click away, but it's just to get our more community people involved into our site. But ab ab absolutely everything is free from us. PayPal be also involved in any dispute handling, like for example, I buy some services and some money is transferred and then uh, the services are not good or maybe it's not given or something, uh, is the disputes and stuff? Uh... PayPal always goes with the mantra of being on the consumer side. So there is dispute resolution. Uh, if you actually buy, it, buy some services and goods through PayPal and you end up not getting the service that you thought that you were getting through the merchant side, you can always dispute that transaction. 
And what PayPal looks for is documentation from both the side, documentation from the merchant, documentation from the consumer, and then they make a classification of how it is actually going to be able to be resolved. If it happens so that you are right with the documentation that you've provided of the services that you asked for and you didn't get, uh, obviously uh, we are on the customer side and we will uh, fulfill and uh, credit to you back into your account, your PayPal account, uh, whatever transaction amount you had spent. I have observed that uh, those buttons uh, comes up with a form with hidden fields where you uh, mention the uh, payer email and the amount and, and stuff like that. Now, how do, how do I take care of the security issue? Because uh, like Fire, Firefox browser has a tool called Firebug. Mm -hmm. So anybody can just use that and change the hidden variables and the amount. And they submit the, uh, they click on the buy now button. Then the modified amount gets submitted to PayPal. So I was wondering how, how do I handle this uh, part of... Uh... But it still needs to be authenticated on PayPal's side. So even if they actually pass the uh, uh, hidden field or if it's a phishing attack that's coming onto our side... No, PayPal itself gives a form with hidden fields. No, no, I'm talking about if you give the form field, PayPal gives you a form field, you fill out the... Uh, you integrate the form field over there, and if someone else like you're saying, can change the variables of what that field needs to uh, include or if it's a phishing attack, it still is, the token still needs to come from PayPal, so you still have to authenticate. So if, if me as a user uh, am donating something to onto your site, I still have to enter my credentials, and I know the amount that I want to pay you versus what you're actually asking of PayPal. So if, let's say, I wanted to pay you $10, but somehow through a phishing attack, someone used my credentials and came to PayPal and asked for $15, it still needs to get to authenticated on PayPal side. So until unless that authentication happens and until unless uh, no, the tokens say, are... Say I have a buy now button, please. Yes. So I have a product which I'm selling. It's a quick payment uh, I have integrated on my uh, website. Now the buy now button comes up with a form which uh, with the uh, predefined hidden fields and the amount. Yep. So now the product costs, say, $10, right? So if somebody is just uh, uh, tweaking the amount and making it $5, so what kind of authentication, like, uh, there are no tokens. The di amount directly gets submitted to PayPal. But it still has to go through the gateway. Yeah. It still has to be authenticated in some way or form, and it still has to be validated. So that, that, uh, that uh, the onus is on the uh, it's developer's on, on, part uh, to... To make sure that you're passing, amount is uh, you're passing the correct amount, and then the onus is on PayPal side to make sure it's the fields that are actually coming over. They are the ones that you actually are sending. All right, guys, thank you very much uh, for your time.